Sure I will, if the morning goes along. So let's begin with a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you for protection in times of light and in darkness. We thank you for looking after us even when things go bump in the night. Join us this morning with your Holy Spirit and help us draw closer to you and closer to one another. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. Uh, do you have a favorite spooky story? I've always been kind of an Ichabod Crane fan myself, Legend of Sleepy Hollow. Uh, and the best spooky stories often are allegorical and teaching stories. Um, what do you think, Clee? You got a favorite sp spooky story? Does mm. Casper count? <laughs> sure. sure. <laughs> Casper is a friendly spooky story. Anybody else? <clears throat> Maybe nobody likes spooky stories. Oh, that's not fair. Okay, yeah. tell me, Mike, what's your favorite spooky well, there's story? There's so many to choose from. I pick one. There's a head of horseman. There's a. That's a combined crazy. Like a spooky story? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 got it on there. All the Stephen King stuff. Pen and Stephen King story. Anything. Okay. Not it. Not it. Right, Mr. Lee. That's not the pain of heart. I feel like it is. Redundant to say evil clown. Right. There is no need to yeah. specify. Just say one or the other. Just yeah, one or the other. It, it covers both. Um, so there are actually lots of spooky stories in the Bible, and we're we're going to cover several of them today. However, I have to share with you that one thing is glaring in its absence today in the bulletin. There is no responsive reading because I could not find a spooky song. Maybe one of you can think of one. Virgie's a better Bible scholar than I am. Robert's not here today, so he can, he's not here to call my hand on this. I, I could not think of a spooky song for us to to share in this morning. <clears throat> but I did find out, so I don't know if I learned this or if I was reminded of it. At my age, the, the learning and the reminding kind of get blurred together. But it turns out that people who practice witchcraft like to recite the songs before they get started. Now, now this to me is kind of like liking to put on a football helmet before you go and detonate explosives. Maybe it'd be a good idea not to detonate the explosives. Maybe that would be a better plan than the football helmet. But here's the thing. Uh, these folks are, are about to mess with spirits they can't control. They're about to rush in where angels fear to tread. They're, they're about to open themselves up to forces that are much bigger than they are. And they feel like at that moment, they need to invoke the power and protection of God. So let me ask you this. Are they more likely to invoke the power and protection of God before they start out on their day's work? Or are we who say we are people of faith more likely? Which one is likely to forget? Which, what was the last time you said to yourself, I'm kind of skating on thin ice here. Now, Mind you, there's no shortage of the number of times I have skated on thin ice. There is a shortage of the, the number of times that just before I have set out into dangerous territory, I've said, maybe 
this isn't wise. Usually I, I start thinking that about the time the ice starts cracking underneath me. Hmm. Maybe this wasn't wise to start out. Maybe I should have been invoking God's protection or better still, God's wisdom to not do this in the first place. Those who practice the dark arts always turn to the Psalms. Some of them even have their own little medicine kits. Uh, this is a practice that I think they've mostly borrowed from Native American spirituality. Um, the medicine bag is something that uh, many traditional Native people carry. Sometimes it only has tobacco in it. It never has wacky tobacco in it, in spite of what other people have accused us of. Sometimes it only has tobacco in it, but sometimes it has reminders of specific powerful places and moments in your life so if you felt especially close to god listening to your grandfather sitting on a rock underneath an apple tree you might put a little sliver of that rock in your medicine bag and that medicine bag is sacred to you so when you pray you would sometimes unroll the items in that bag and be reminded of those places and times God has been closest to you and spoken to you in the most powerful way. Those who practice the dark arts have started borrowing that practice from Native American people and they often have, did you all get these when you were kids? The, the, uh, Oh, what's that group? The Gideons would give out these tiny little New Testaments that they weren't microfilm, but they, they just about should have come with a microfilm reader. And, and the people who practice the dark arts will take those little tiny New Testaments and put them in their medicine bag for protection. Now, before we cast stones at them for being so crazy, let's slow down just a moment. Consider the number of church members, practicing Christians in good standing in the church. In the United Methodist Church, what we mean by a member is good standing, and good standing is, can you put fog on a mirror? That, that's pretty much the only test we use. Okay. Are you still breathing? Cool. You're a member in good standing. Uh, and uh, if you consider the number of members in good standing who take that book out and read it and process it and make it something they integrate into their souls versus the number who feel like it's good to have it on their shelf, but they never take it down. Um, honestly, aren't, aren't we engaging in the same kind of charm worship by keeping around a book we don't read as those who practice the dark arts are by getting a little Gideon Bible to put in their bag? I'm going to shut up now and wait for you all to share your thoughts for the moment. Urgy, you look deeply thoughtful. You look like you're thinking, if I say it, I get in trouble. I'm going to say it anyway. <laughs> I just remember my mom. <laughs> she had all this small little tiny Jesus Christ uh, thing that um, uh, put on the medicine, put in the air. She just put everyone, let's say I'm sick, she just make a necklace and put that with me. <laughs> so I, I, she has too much stuff that she just do it that I can't imagine. Well, last night we were uh, watching a video on YouTube about uh, Appalachian uh, witchery and 
superstition and uh, mountain people did the same thing. You know, we, you, you get sick here, here's the necklace. Put it on. Dream catchers are an interesting <clears throat> thing. They've kind of become a part of But dream catchers are not traditional. They're tchotchkes made to sell tourists. <laughs> and and uh, so it's become so ubiquitous I that even the Indians, ones with the smaller meshes are more effective than the ones. With right, yeah, the they, uh, they are. The smaller meshes catch smaller demons, and those are the ones you've got to watch out for. Uh, and this is a picture of how weird it is to be uh, from a traditional society in 21st century America. I stopped at a convenience store on Interstate 81 because I had to. And uh, I went in and there was a, a great big box of Native American dream catchers made in China. <laughs> sure. There's some Cherokee stuff. They're, they're always on. We, we, my eyes are slantier than theirs, so it, it's bound to be true. Uh, yeah, okay, we're, I'm just going to stop chasing rabbit trails here. The point is that the people who practice the dark arts believe that God can protect them. I, I wonder how quickly we turn to God for protection in our own, that honestly, you know, I, I count on my airbags to protect me, my, my uh, three-point harness to protect me. I, I count on all kinds of inoculations to protect me. I, I count on all kinds of science to protect me. Um, last night there was supposed to be a huge solar flare. Mm -hmm. Arriving, it was too much, too cloudy, too cloudy. It for was, us it was up there, but it was too cloudy. Mics. How do you know? Did you see it? Um, <laughs> yes, <laughs> I, I saw the clouds. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, thought about putting on a tinfoil hat to protect myself from the radiation, but tonight's supposed to be another. Good chance of seeing foil hats for everybody. everybody. <laughs> <laughs> and, but I, 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 I changed my course this morning. I can go somewhere without my driver's license, but I cannot go anywhere without this. Oh, my mom gave me when I'm four years old. Gotta it's take like, that protection. It's a mama Mary. That's <laughs> 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 I'm four years old. I still have it. <laughs> Bill Davenport? Yeah, it, when you, you mentioned about stuff we, we value, or at least what we verbally value, uh, and we put them on a shelf and rather get, gather dust. Uh, in a previous life I, that I led, uh, one of the things that uh, we, we did is industrial safety, health and safety. And you can go pretty much across the board anywhere you choose to and ask to see a safety program and pulled on these beautiful documents and, and great binders and they're really pretty and are covered in dust. And they have a accident, <laughs> a health accident rate that's through the roof. You know, and that same thing's true of our soul. You know, I, I really believe that, uh, that, that we tended to put these things in place uh, and let it gather dust rather than make it active. Amen. Uh, we, we do tend to make our, our own safety plans and, and put them on the shelf. And it's not just safety plans, is it? Uh, what was it that you mentioned when COVID started? You said the risk of driving is much higher. <laughs> yeah, I was, I was downplaying COVID when it all started because I was one of the people saying a week. <laughs> Two weeks. Yes, you were. <laughs> yeah, driving is still more risky than COVID, but uh, still, turned out this COVID thing lasted a little longer than I expected and caused a little bit more disruption than I expected. And 
then keys in with another point. It's not just safety plans that then sit on the shelf and gather dust. Most Methodist churches have five-year plans, and it takes a lot of work to develop a five-year plan. And once you're done with all that work developing the five-year plan, it's time to do it. <laughs> yeah. And, and even when we have the best of intentions to implement the plan, God says, oh, yeah, COVID. <laughs> <laughs> And then what do you do? <laughs> that apparently. There you go. <laughs> the light at the end of the tunnel. There you go. You all said to play John Henry? <laughs> <laughs> hey, you turn his back. Just press a button, Robin. Any button. Try shaking it, Robin. Any button. Give me a button. I was going to say, give me the phone. <laughs> Try shaking it. <laughs> oh, believe me. <laughs> it doesn't help, but it does amuse me to watch you shake. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so, any more thoughts on this? Peace story. The extra color we can bring Okay. We can do that. Okay. I mean, I do wear black typically because I wear clothes, or not because I'm typically uh, dark. <laughs> so we have got some spooky stories of uh, all kinds of paranormal stuff. <laughs> in the scripture today. Uh, I did mention the, uh, the gospel reading is from Matthew 14 today where Jesus shows up walking on the water. And I mentioned in, in my Facebook post this week that I knew this passage very well, but it took a comedian friend of mine, a stand-up comic, to point out what's kind of obvious. If Jesus knew all things as he was walking toward him, then Jesus had to know he was fixing to scare the bejesus out of him. And, and this is easy to believe if you keep in mind, this was a bunch of guys traveling around together for three years. Now, I have a theory. It's a pet theory of mine that if you take a room full of guys and you take their average IQ, let's say they're geniuses, let's say it's an IQ of 220, and there's 20 of them in the room, that means that the average IQ in that room, you can divide the real IQ by the number of guys present, and that leaves you an IQ of about 11. <laughs> which, which is roughly the same as a bag of hammers. <laughs> this is true of disciples as much as it is football teams. Because look, time after time you see Jesus explaining something to them and you go, yeah, I get that. And the disciples go, uh, what do you mean? Well, that's because there are a bunch of guys in a room together. They've been traveling around, and when guys are together, they talk smack and they prank each other. That's what guys do. So you know the guys had to be going around in this holy cadre, this group of spiritual disciples, and they had to be saying things like, Oh, Simon, man, put your shoes back on. Those are the stankiest feet. I have that. Don't put your feet by the fire, Simon. Put your shoes back on. It's the kind of way guys talk to each other. You guys are behind your masks right now, and so I'm, I'm not getting much response, but I know. I know. I have been a guy at times in my life. And you know that if Jesus knew all things, as he was walking toward this bunch of guys on the lake, he was saying, <laughs> 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 uh, 
They're going to think they're seeing a ghost or something. He had to know that before he got there. And even, even the way the scripture records it, he's going, it is I. Be not afraid. He had to be trying to just freak them out. Now, this makes perfect sense to me because yes, that's the dramatic. I think. He did have it, and God has a sense of humor. Did you look in the mirror this morning? <laughs> God has a sense of humor, and every time I tell God what my plans are, He snickers. And and every time I make a prediction, God laughs out loud. Hey, a week. Maybe two weeks, this whole COVID thing will blow over. And God said, <laughs> <laughs> And I'm convinced every now and then, when I get too big for my own britches, God slaps an archangel on the back and says, Michael, Mayer, a minute. Watch this. I'm going to mess with Larry. <laughs> So that's the closest we get to a ghost story in the Gospels. Where do you see yourself in the ghost story of Jesus on the water? Are you one of the guys he's messing with? <laughs> it is I, the Lord, be not afraid. You know that had to make him afraid. <laughs> it, it was a perfect setup too. Yeah. Because they're in a boat in the middle of the sea. Where are they going to go? Yeah. <laughs> they can't escape. Yeah. They're, they know they're going to die. <laughs> and the wind is whipping his robe around, <laughs> and the waves are splashing, <clears throat> and he's going. <clears throat> and of course he did that for <laughs> Well, yeah. <laughs> now, Peter could have escaped though. Yeah, you know, he, he's walking on it too. He, no, he, he, he went straight. He, he went straight down. Off, he, he, he he went <clears throat> and so the message is still the same. Keep your eyes on Jesus, even when he's messing with you. <laughs> Any other thoughts? Maybe it's just me. Maybe I'm the only one. Jesus. <laughs> but if Christ is messing with you, know you're in pretty good company. Let's go ahead and pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you again for this Halloween, for this festive season. We ask you to open our hearts to sing your praise and grow closer to you and closer to one another, even when you are messing with us. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 We're going to take a break now, and we'll have uh, about 10 minutes. We'll get together and start worship together. And there's some snacks in the kitchen.
Grace United Methodist Church in Parkwood. Morning. 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 This is the Halloween the Lord has made. Let us rejoice, rejoice. and be, be glad, glad in it. I, I must have had church on Halloween sometime or another in my life. I just don't remember when. But I would say it was right near the, uh, the, the end of October sometime. <laughs> Probably. We've got charge conference tomorrow night at 7. Immediately following worship service, we're going to take a tour of the stained glass window. And a colorful tour it will be. Are there other announcements we need to share at this time? Very good, very good. Then once again, we welcome you. Uh, we, uh, we are celebrating today the, the life of Shirley Fletcher, who we finally laid to rest yesterday. <laughs> Sorry, my mind is a little disheveled. Shirley Ryder, thank you. Uh, and uh, we're celebrating all of you here as well. Uh, Robbie, it looks like you've got the scariest costume today. Uh, that is a costume, isn't it? Mm -hmm. That is a costume, isn't it? Uh, it's not going to be on very long. Okay. <laughs> mm. <laughs> We're, we're doing spooky Bible stories today, and I could not find a spooky song, so I don't have a spooky uh, response of reading for you, but I do have a spooky opening prayer, so I invite you to turn to the opening prayer from found printed in your bulletin. Lord, we thank you for waking us in our right mind and setting our feet on the solid ground. Protects us from ghosts and wolves and things that go on in the night and lead us to victory in the way of light. Amen. Janet, I believe you are reading for us today. Actually, I think this is a fun day to be here. You made it very interesting. Our gospel reading is from Matthew 14. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. After he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. Later that night, he was there alone, and the boat was already a considerable distance from land buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them, walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, take courage, it is I, do not be afraid. The New Testament reading comes from Acts 16. Once when we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a female slave who had a spirit by which she predicted the future. She earned a great deal of money for her owners by fortune telling. She followed Paul and the rest of us shouting, these men are servants of the most high God who are telling you the way to be saved. She kept this up for many days. Finally, Paul became so annoyed that he turned around and said to the spirit, in the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. In that moment, the spirit left her. The first Old Testament reading is 1 Samuel 28. When Saul saw the Philistine army, he was afraid. Terror filled his heart. He inquired of the Lord, but the Lord did not answer him by dreams or Urim or prophets. Saul then said to his attendants, Find me a woman who is a medium 
So I may go and inquire of her. There is one in Endor, they said. So Saul disguised himself, putting on other clothes, and at night he and two men went to the woman. Consult the spirit for me, he said, and bring out for me the one I named. But the woman said to him, Surely you know what Saul has done. He has cut off the mediums and the spirit, spiritualists from the land. Why have you set a trap for my life to bring about my death? Saul swore to her by the Lord, As surely as the Lord lives, you will not be punished for this. Then the woman asked, Whom shall I bring up for you? Bring up Samuel, he said. When the woman saw Samuel, she cried out at the top of her voice and said to Saul, Why have you deceived me? You are Saul. The king said to her, Don't be afraid. What do you see? The woman said, I see a ghostly spirit coming out of the earth. The sermon text is Daniel 5. King Belshazzar gave a great banquet for a thousand of his nobles and drank wine with them. While Belshazzar was drinking his wine, he gave orders to bring in the gold and silver goblets that his father, Nebuchadnezzar, had taken from the temple in Jerusalem so that the king and his nobles, his wives, and his concubines might drink from them. So they brought in the gold goblets that had been taken from the temple of God in Jerusalem, and the king and his nobles, his wives and his concubines, drank from them. As they drank the wine, they praised the gods of gold and silver, of bronze, iron, wood, and stone. Suddenly, the fingers of a human hand appeared and wrote on the plaster of the wall near the lamp stand in the royal palace. The king watched, and the hand, as it wrote, his face turned pale, and he was so frightened that his legs became weak, and his knees were not. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, stop. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of spooky stuff in the Bible today, and maybe some of you are spooks, too. Uh, we want to share your joys and your concerns and your prayer requests. So let's start with the good news. Anything good going on? Yeah, I think so. Nancy is, uh, who many of you know, uh, Nancy is in the rehab center and doing well. Uh, yes. Daily improvement, so life Amen. is good. Amen. Love and prayers for Nancy as she recuperates in the rehab center. Looking forward to her being home with us. Bill Swarn? I'm five minutes late because I ran into David in the parking lot. That's the good news. He starts a new job on Monday over in Warrington. So we have the weekends free and Sundays free. He's looking forward to joining us every Sunday. Yay. Amen. Excited to have David uh, having weekends off. It's like uh, having a regular life. No more night time? No, no more night time. <coughs> No more teaching. Be crazy for Virgin. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 All right. Any other good news to share? It's kind of silly, but anyway, the uh, Cold Eagle Project is out there in the corner and it's getting ready to be used, I guess, more now that the uh, seasons are changing and we have hangers for putting totes up. So cool. That's something different that we haven't had in years. Mm -hmm. Okay. Good to see Grace this morning. Yes. I think it's great to live. <laughs> uh, need help next Saturday morning at 9. We're going to honor our veterans and their families. So I need help with the bike. Thank you. Joe, uh, was, Joe was stuck in South Carolina, so he can't wait. Thank you. Um, this uh, this coming Sunday, the, the 7th, will be All Saints Day, and we will 
honor those who have lit your way uh, as servants of God. We'll especially remember those who passed in the previous 12 months from this church, and we'll lit, light a candle in their honor. Um, but be thinking about who the saints are that are cheering you on even now, whose very presence still lights your way, because we want you to share their names and lift up their story to God as we gather together next week. The following Sunday, the 14th, will be Veterans Sunday. And uh, we're not sure what we'll do yet, but we'll, we always have special uh, things for Veterans Sunday. And the last Sunday of November, um, let's see, we're only a few weeks away from now. The last Sunday of November is the first Sunday of Advent. We're almost there. Isn't that ridiculous? Like, weren't we just there a year ago? No, wait, yeah. Kind of. No. Any other joys to share? Any other good news? Very good. Um, let's turn our attention to prayer concerns. We do want to uh, continue to lift up the Ryder Fletcher family. We want to uh, pray for healing for Nancy. We want to continue to pray for strength for all of those who are struggling right now. Uh, Greg and uh, Catherine Snyder need our prayers, um, not just for now, but for the future. Greg has been active in the men's group since uh, they came back to church, and uh, Catherine has started the Prayers and Squares group. They've, they've been a great addition to our number. Uh, Greg's dad passed... Uh, kind of unexpectedly this week. He had been uh, getting worse for a while. Um, but uh, the lifestyle changing thing for the Snyders is that mom has Alzheimer's and she's moving in with them. Um, they have a gorgeous house, but it is not set up for someone with mo mobility issues. So lots of concerns for them as they move forward. Uh, same thing for us. You'll know Barbara's not here. Mom is getting less and less mobile, and uh, it's getting to be more and more difficult for Barbara to manage two of us. Uh, so your prayers are appreciated for that. We do thank you for all your prayers for my dad. He did have a couple of good days this week. He's not doing so well now. This is not unusual with a stroke patient for them to have days of up and down, and neither the good days nor a couple of bad days is a trend. I have seen many times where when somebody is about to make their final uh, downward movement to the grave, God pulls back the curtain a little bit, and they have a few good days, and they're able to respond to their loved ones, and they, they feel better. And I've seen a few times where somebody went on a, a downward spiral after a stroke, and they had a slow but dramatic reversal, and God raised them up to complete health and strength all over again. We don't know which path my dad is on right now. I do know that he's in intensive care and frequently uh, they have a COVID patient in intensive care. When they do, not even my mom can get in to see him. Um, once he's out and in the hospital, uh, he's still only allowed one outside visitor. So even if I was there, I couldn't go in and see him. Unless they say he's dying. Um, and here's the thing. Um, most hospitals are not programmed to admit they're letting somebody die. 
most of the time, if you start down that spiral, they'll transfer you out. I've never heard an administrator confirm this to me, but I'm an old man. I'm allowed to be cynical. I believe it's because it makes their statistics <coughs> look better if nobody dies in there. <coughs> so, in any case, the point is, my plan right now for the next couple of weeks is I have no plan. I, I don't know what we're going to do. I don't know when we're going to do it. All I do know is that over the next week or so, we'll find out whether my dad is getting better or getting worse. And we'll respond accordingly. So once again, thank you for your prayers. Thank you for praying for my mom. Uh, and uh, thank you for everything you do at this time. Who else can we be praying for? What other needs have we got? Yes, Mike? Uh, continue prayers for Carlene's dad. Uh, as days go on, <coughs> the dementia grabs a little bit harder and stronger, and his life, uh, as he remembered it, slips away. Yes. <coughs> and um, please continue prayers for me. We've got a surgery date for my uh, kidney procedure. It's on the 26th. Of November seems a long way off, but there's a lot of things in between that you know stopped it from happening sooner than later. But things are what they are, and God's got it. Amen. We'll keep praying for you, Mike, and we know God's got it. <clears throat> Prayers for anyone else who's uh, having Alzheimer's or dementia issues, but seems like we're hearing it more and more in a lot younger people as well. Um, so prayers for that, and prayers for my uh, dear friend and neighbor, Patty McHugh, whose sister died unexpectedly um, at work on Friday. Hmm. So yeah. out of the blue and only in her 60s, they think maybe DVT. Very good. Love and prayers for that family and, she, she, and for she, others. Well, yes? Um, yeah, I was glad they were able to get to meet Patty and my grandson, Andrew. Um, he has children, and of course, you know, everything gets delayed now. So it's a three-week mm -hmm. wait before they can start treating him there. So it's really sad. Oh, sure. He's doing fine with the COVID. It's just a policy. Yeah. 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 Very good. Raise up my neighbor Dean, who's awaiting surgery for um, kidney stones. Amen. Yes. The Friel family. The Friel family. Thank you. Uh, Alan is still awaiting uh, some <coughs> some. Uh, Procedures that he has to go through before he can have the heart surgery. Uh, Jenny still needs a lot of prayer as she uh, looks at rehab. Any others? That's a year for once a member of my Bible study passed away for COVID. That's very active. She never missed the Bible study. I know that community feels that loss, and uh, it's a worldwide loss now. We do welcome those of you who are joining us on uh, electronic means rather than in person. We appreciate you being here today, and we want you to know if you leave us a message, we'll pray for your prayer concerns as well. Right now, let's go to God together. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this joyful season, this playful season, this season of ghosts and ghoulies, and we thank you that in the end, your light always transforms our darkness. So, Lord, come this morning and hear us as we call out to you those needs, those names, and those sorrows and hurts that you need to touch right now. Even so, Lord, we thank you for the victory in your name through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we thank you for teaching us how to pray. <coughs> our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. 
several spooky Bible stories. The Bible has a lot of spooky stuff in it. We, uh, we tend to skip over this stuff when we're doing the, the Bible school presentations. But there, there's plenty of stuff to go around for those with taste toward a little, things a little bit more, let's say, unusual. Um, over and over, the Old Testament law says again and again and again and again, you shall not have a witch or a warlock or a soothsayer or a fortune teller or a diviner or none of that stuff in your midst. And the Bible scholars say, hmm, if the law says again and again and again, don't do that. Maybe it's because again and again and again and again, people keep doing that. Here's a curious thing. The more hopeless and powerless and perilous life is, the more they turn to witchcraft and the dark arts. Take Haiti, for example. If witchcraft and the dark arts helped anybody's life get better, people would be rich in Haiti, right? And yet, their lives are constantly some of the poorest, the most difficult, the most violent, the most scary lives on earth, and they keep train, turning to voodoo and hoodoo and witchcraft and all kinds of things, because when people feel lost, hopeless, and, and imperiled, they turn to the dark arts. Well, why do I mention this? Because one of the fastest growing religious movements in America today is witchcraft. Hmm. Do you suppose it could be because in 2020 and 2020, excuse me, 2021, as perhaps no time in recent memory, People are feeling more imperiled, more hopeless, and more helpless than ever before. Maybe that's why they're turning to the dark arts. And maybe that's why we need to have something else to offer them. So, one of the things that I have found when you have a disagreement with somebody, and by the way, when it turns when it comes to people practicing the dark arts. I have a disagreement with them. <laughs> but one of the ways you can reach somebody with whom you have a disagreement is to find a point of agreement. So the point we can agree on is the Bible does have some spooky stories. In King Saul's day, he outlawed the practice of witchcraft and mediums and whatnot. And you will recall he was the first king of Israel, and Samuel was a pain in his side. <laughs> Samuel was constantly saying, you're not doing it right. You're not being the kind of king God wants you to be. Fair enough. The thing is, there had never been a king of Israel before, so Saul didn't know how to act. And he was counting on no Samuel to tell him what to do. And instead of telling him what to do, Samuel kept telling him what not to do. And what not to do was 
everything you've been doing, so I'll knock it off. Samuel was a difficult old character. Well, not that we have any of those here. But let's just say, if I was in Saul's position, and the Philistines were coming, and I was scared to death, the last person I would have said for the witch to bring up out of the earth would be Samuel. Because you know Samuel never had anything good to say to Saul while he was alive. Why would he expect it to change once the old booger was dead? So Saul looked around. He, he was feeling hopeless, helpless, and imperiled. And he said, maybe I better turn to the dark arts. And they said, you know, you chased all those people out, but there still might be one or two. I think you can find one over in the village of Endor. Saul talked her into coming out of retirement. And she called Samuel up out of the earth, and Samuel said, now you've done messed up. Now you have disturbed me, and everything's going to get worse. Well, Saul wasn't the only one to discover that by turning to the dark arts, you take something bad, you make it worse. Saul had a namesake in New Testament times. He was the first apostle not named by Jesus in his early ministry. And Saul of Tarsus, we know as Paul, was traveling around and he was being chased by a child who was possessed of a familiar spirit. That's outlawed in the Old Testament, too. A familiar spirit who kept shouting out, These men are telling you how to be saved by the gospel of Jesus Christ. Well, she was telling the truth. It seems strange that Paul would get mad about that. Except, Robbie, ask me, What's the most important thing about comedy? What's the most important thing? Training! <laughs> <laughs> I agree. <laughs> so that's what was wrong. Every time Paul would start talking, she'd start shouting. Listen to him, listen to him, listen to him. Here he is, he's talking, he's talking, he's talking great stuff. And finally, he just got so annoyed that he turned to her and said, in the name of Jesus Christ, get out of that child. And she was healed of that familiar spirit. Suddenly, her mind was at peace for the first time, perhaps, in her life. But the people who owned her and used her as a sideshow uh, side operation, they got really mad because their meal ticket was no longer punched. So for their trouble, Paul and Silas were attacked by a mob, beaten half to death, and thrown in jail. That's what they got for casting a demon out of a child. It's not the only time spooky stories went badly in the Bible. It turns out that here in the Gospel, the disciples were out on the lake trying their best to row across, and Jesus came out to greet them. It is I, the Lord, be not afraid. Here's a universal law of physics. When somebody says to you, now don't be afraid, what are you going to be? Afraid. Yeah, afraid. Jesus had to know that. He had to know that he was going to scare him to death by going, it is I be not afraid. So as he was walking and they were saying he was a ghost, he had to be good. 
Watch this. <laughs> now, I think that's true because I know Jesus does it to me. Anytime I get a little too big for my britches, Jesus turns to an archangel and says, Larry's at it again. Watch this, I'm going to mess with you. <laughs> <laughs> I fear it daily. <laughs> yeah, you're a handful. <laughs> so, if the spirit world kind of gets out of hand when we're dealing with a spiritual force that loves us and embraces us and saves us, you can imagine how far out of hand it can get when we're dealing with forces that want to hurt us and destroy us. I think the spookiest story in the whole Bible has to be the story of the hand writing on the wall. Started innocently enough with a dinner party. I've had dinner parties myself. I never had a spooky disembodied hand show up. I've wondered if there had been a disembodied hand when I looked at how much food was missing after the dinner party. But so far, I've not seen anything like this. <clears throat> the king, not satisfied with drinking and reveling with his buddies in their own power and victory, said, let's bring out the victory cup. Remember that old cup we stole from the temple? The temple of Jehovah, the temple of the great high God. Let's bring that out and party with it. They were messing with spiritual powers and forces they couldn't comprehend. And when you do that, it's kind of like crossing the interstate with your eyes shut. Things are probably not going to go well. They set out into a spiritual cross stream that they knew nothing about, and suddenly there was a huge hand writing on the wall. Many, many tekel you farsi, or farsi, depending on your translation. Many, many tekel you farsi. Everybody saw it. Everybody saw the hand moving. Everybody saw the letters there. You know who could read it? Nobody. <laughs> so they all said, let's bring in some smart people. Because we're all not very smart. We're, we're the beautiful people. We're the popular people. We are not the smart people. Let me pause right there and point out that none of the smart people had been invited to the party. So when you get passed over by the popular people, by the beautiful people, by the powerful people, maybe they're admitting you're one of the smart people. <laughs> they probably had to get them out of bed because smart people go to bed a lot earlier than beautiful, powerful people, right? They probably had to get them in, kind of yawning and stretching and in their nightshirts. And they looked at the wall, many, many, tickle you farsi. And they said, in unison, they said, Kali! This is what smart people say. Shazam! We don't know what that means, Sergeant Carter. We can't even read it. <laughs> so the smart people looked at each other and they said, we better get somebody smarter than us. We better get Daniel in here. Daniel's way smart. And they brought Daniel in and he looked at the handwriting on the wall. And Daniel said, with startling accuracy and clarity, he said, Golly, Shazam! I don't know what it means either, but God knows. Now, I brought you through this spooky journey just to get to this point, so if you kind of got off out in the weeds with me, come, 
Come on back with me now. This is where we were going. The hand wrote on the wall in great big letters, and the hand wrote on the wall right by the lampstand, just in case you weren't paying attention. The hand wrote on the wall right there in the light where everybody could see it, and nobody knew what the sign meant. They all saw the sign. Nobody knew what the sign meant except God. Here we go, y'all. Pretty simple. I believe there have been lots of signs written on lots of walls in 2020 and 2021. There's signs of COVID infection rates. There's signs of CDC. There's significations by Fauci and by Trump and by I don't know who all else. There's all kinds of signs and all kinds of smart people saying, golly. And here's the thing. In spite of what they may tell you, Shazam does not mean they know what it means. God is the only one who knows how to read the signs we're dealing with in this strange year. Daniel had enough sense not to try to be one of the smart people, not to try to hang out with the smart people, not to try to hang out with the beautiful people and the powerful people. Daniel had enough sense to say, God knows what the sign means. Trust God. Daniel had enough sense to say to Nebuchadnezzar, you're forgetting about God. This means you're in deep trouble. That's what the sign means. All the signs we're dealing with, all the signs of powerlessness, all the signs of hopelessness, all the signs of risk, all the signs of turmoil, racial signs, and viral signs, and economic signs, all those signs stacked up together are all a reminder we're not in control, we're not in the hands of the smart people or the beautiful people or the powerful people or the talking heads on TV. We're in God's hands, and he's the only one who knows what these signs mean. So listen to him, follow him, and take some smart people with you. Oh, and by the way, Every now and then, when things get spooky, I want you to look at each other and say, Golly! Shazam! I sure am glad God knows what's next. Let's see. I've referenced uh, Marine a couple of times. Bill, any, any rebuttal, any thoughts to share now? Uh, no rebuttal. No. Okay. <laughs> you did say something that uh, my first cruise is a Navy cruise uh, was to Haiti, and uh, they've been hit by a hurricane. This is back in night, uh, long time ago. And, uh, <laughs> but it was just amazing to me <clears throat> to see people who were practicing witchcraft. Uh, I remember refueling at Port-au-Prince, and uh, and they were selling. Uh, monkey wood, monkey pod, and I said, I gotta have that, I gotta have that. So I had a nice collection, as did my buddies. And uh, unfortunately, two weeks later, all the little uh, uh, termites or whatever <laughs> came out of wood. So we had termites all over my <laughs> So everything I had bought. Uh, didn't have microwaves back then. That's what you do with yeah, microwaves. Yeah, you put right. it in the microwave. Life is short, Bill. I'm sorry? Life is short. 
That would be wooden ships, would it? <laughs> no. <laughs> Bill, I don't know if it was from Haiti, but we bought a house one time and had some kind of a tiki statue out the back that had a, a, a demonic looking monkey with a mouth open where they had been making some kind of fire in with the. I burned it. I burned it. <laughs> <laughs> Any other thoughts? You know that place uh, between the, the Carolinas, quite in the border between the North and South Carolina? South of the border. Shelton Church. Sorry? Shelton Church. It was actually burned during the mm -hmm. revolution. when I did, I got a very eerie feeling, and uh, uh, the feeling is um, when politics and church combine, um, it's quite spooky, and uh, it, the place is in ruin, the graveyard is completely torn up, and, and uh, the only graves that were left alone were the child's graves, and the very large graves that were too heavy. Uh, and it's part of history, I think, that uh, people wanted to erase. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a very eerie place. And maybe those are the kind of things that are written on the wall that says, hey, um, don't combine politics with your spiritual church. Um, keep it apart, or at least keep it in a sensible uh, manner. Okay, thank you for that. Anybody else? Any thoughts about spooky Bible stories or favorite spooky stories? <coughs> yeah. All right, about 100 years ago, when I, when I was a teenager, a group of us from Woodbridge went up to Pohick Church in Fairfax County. And if anybody doesn't know about Pohick po Church, there's a mausoleum there, and it is haunted, or so I've heard. So we went up there, and and I'm pretty sure alcohol was involved. I'm not going to say it might was, because it was. And we got into the mausoleum, and we had parked way far away, and we started hearing these strange noises. And I want to tell you something. It scared the pajeezies out of me. I was scared to death. Well, come to find out, it was kids from another school that got there before we did. <laughs> but then the really scary part was, when the Fairfax County Police showed up, they were searching for us, and I was hiding in the weeds, getting as low as a snake in a rut, watching footprints go, or, you know, foot traffic go by me while I was searching in flashlights. That was probably scarier than a, than a ghost story. So, stay out of mausoleums at nighttime. Yeah, Bill? Some of you know the history of our church. Many do not, but... Grace Methodist is listed as one of the haunted uh, churches in the state of Virginia. And uh, there, there's a old sea stories about the, a light up in the uh, second floor over there, somebody walking over there at night and so forth. So if you find a book, it has a good story. To so was, was that story of, uh, of Grace being haunted by old spooks was that invented before I arrived? Or? <laughs> Long before you arrived. Very good. Well, we have some guests here today, and uh, we're going to go ahead and... Uh, Virgie, did you have your hand up? Yeah, it, it's a real story, and nobody believed me. And <laughs> in the Skyline Drive, 15 years ago. Uh, now it's a yellow house. That house has been burned. Do you guys remember that? Burn. And that I'm coming from, I'm going home from work and I'm driving in that skyline and it's nighttime, 9 I remember the story. And I, you see the story? Um, I yeah. see the ghost is a white right in front of my car and I don't even know that house is one and one old lady passed away. I don't even know. And I saw her right in front of my car. It's a white, it's a ghost, it's just all white lady 
long hair. And when I go home, I told to my husband, <gasps> somebody at the house just burned and uh, all crazy was, and nobody believed me after now. <laughs> <laughs> and it's real, I saw it in my eyes. Show of hands, who believes, Bertie? No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 50 50. <laughs> we have healing. <laughs> so go now in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. 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 Happy Halloween, y'all. Amen. And if you'd like to stay for a stained glass conversation.